From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudge Mudler, and this matters. New regulation of big technology and social media is coming in Canada and around the world. Bill C-10 is the Canadian government's attempt to update regulations around streaming services and social media. And it became big news earlier this week when a recently added clause has been interpreted to mean that any piece of user-generated content could potentially be treated as from a publisher and then be subjected to regulations and oversight. This has alarmed many, including legal and technology experts, as well as the opposition. So Minister of Heritage Stephen Gilbo has said it will be crystal clear that the bill won't cover every cat video anyone posts. But this is likely just the beginning as the government tackles this bill and has planned more oncoming regulations around online harm. Emily Laidlaw is a Canada Research Chair in Cybersecurity Law and an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary. She joins us to talk about the controversy surrounding Bill C-10, the difficulties of online regulation, and what's to come next. Dr. Laidlaw, thank you so much for making the time to join us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. There's a lot to talk about right now, and obviously there's been a lot of news about Bill C-10. I think I want to talk a little bit of a step back because traditionally Canada has taken a pretty hands-off approach to regulating a lot of our online interactions and online media. Now, they say that the big motivator here is to modernize some of these laws because people are consuming more things online. Is that probably a good place to start and why the government is sort of enacting this legislation now or attempting to? I think it's a great place to start. And I think that there's kind of two things going on, which is, you know, one is that how we've always regulated the internet, this is kind of the story of that, because that provides a bit of the backdrop to some of the debates here. But also the fact that our laws do need modernizing. Certainly some of the debates that we're having right now, when I was living in the UK, we were, we're having some of those debates 10 years ago. And so, you know, we're due in Canada to, to reflect more deeply on, on how to regulate now in light of, you know, digitization. Let's start with Bill C-10, which was actually introduced in November, has been working its way through, but it kind of mushroom clouded this week in terms of some of the controversies involving it. This bill is supposed to regulate online streaming services and social media networks and have them sort of come in line to what our terrestrial broadcasters have to do and follow rules like CanCon. Is that sort of the motivation for that bill and where it started from? Yeah, that's right. Well, so broadcasting has always been an arena that's been more heavily regulated than other spaces. It's more heavily regulated than newspapers. It's more heavily regulated than, you know, our public squares. But broadcasting and the nature of how we consume content has changed. You know, if you just think of the way that we use Netflix and the amount that we go on YouTube and and all of that. And so it was due for modernization. So I have been generally supportive, at least in that kind of mindset when it came to Bill C-10. But the move a week ago to remove that what seems to be now the infamous Section 4.1 that was providing a broad protection to social media companies, that was a complete about face and it was poorly thought through and has a huge impact on kind of how we use the internet and how we express ourselves in a way that's a huge overreach for broadcasting regulation. Let's be very clear about what exactly happened there. So basically, we're sort of nearing the end point of this bill. And all the way along, it was said that social media and people's social media's postings were not going to be regulated. All of a sudden, I believe it was liberal Julie de Bruson who sort of added this clause. And now many have interpreted that it would make people's social media posts on all sorts of platforms, be it TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, potentially come up under regulation. Now... This has created a wave of backlash and concern. I mean, the opposition parties are objecting, people are lying or freaking out, and now the Liberals have promised change. Let's talk a little bit about this. First off, was it a surprise, simply because throughout the process, this wasn't part of the negotiations for this bill, correct? Oh, yeah, it was not a part of it, and it's it's a huge surprise. And partly because... It makes no sense in a Western democracy that's so committed to freedom of expression to implement this kind of strict regulation. But also it was just not thoughtful. 
if they really have a narrower mandate, and that's something that we can talk about, you know, if, if the target really wasn't social media, you know, user generated content, okay, don't draft it that way. But this isn't even a matter of just different interpretations. And I've been really unsatisfied with, you know, some of the commentary I've seen from Minister Gibault, for example, saying, well, that's not the target. Okay, fine. Don't target then user generated content. But we have to work with the text that we have. And on its face, this bill says social media companies would be responsible for all user generated content, essentially as a form of a broadcasting program. What exactly does that mean? If I were to post, say, something with me and my daughter doing the latest dance crave on TikTok, how could something like that be regulated by the government with this new law? How would that look? I just don't understand that part. Yeah, well, and it's ridiculous, but that would be the result. So let me just kind of break it down. So, you know, when I said that broadcasting regulation has always been more onerous, right? And it's the idea that it's a push media into our homes. And so we want it to have certain features. We want it to have more Canadian content. The Bill C-10 wants Canadian content to be even more discoverable, right? So that it's much easier to find that Canadian content. But also there's just broader policy objectives with broadcasting that broadcasters need to sort of be, you know, looking at ways to enrich our culture with the kind of Canadian focused content. Okay, fine, right? It's a very narrow type of regulation. What this provision though creates is it says, look, if you're a social media company, like for example, YouTube, then you are not only responsible, say, for any content that you might create or any content that's affiliated, you now need to treat all the content, all the user-generated content, including, you know, your video with your daughter, right? as a type of broadcasting program. So suddenly YouTube looks really different. YouTube isn't just this space where we find all these random weird videos. YouTube is now more like our TV. It's a selection of programs that are curated by the broadcaster. And that social media company, so YouTube, would be required then to comply with all the broadcasting policy objectives and all those rules. It would need to make Canadian content discoverable. It would need to have a certain amount of Canadian content pushed to us. So it changes entirely the face of it. So it doesn't regulate us as users. Like we're not gonna be dragged before the CRTC, but it does regulate YouTube. It forces YouTube to treat us like we are a broadcasting program and it forces YouTube to treat content in a really different way. That's probably the best breakdown I've heard of that, <laughs> just how, how it would affect me. And I mean, this is one of those things that right now I'm thinking about it. So does this mean that on my YouTube channel, I'd have to make sure that there'd be 30% CanCon? Not you as much as YouTube would have to make sure. Right. So YouTube would treat your video as either contributing or not contributing to the Canadian content requirements. And it will then change how it orders this content and pushes it to all the very different Canadian users. And this is why it's a free speech issue. How is YouTube, and again, I, I don't mean to pick on YouTube, but this seems to be kind of the natural platform of this. How would YouTube comply? Well, YouTube is then going to have to engage in all kinds of regulatory behavior that we've all resisted because of the free speech concerns. It's going to have to heavily monitor content. It's probably going to have to use, you know, different forms of artificial intelligence or, you know, even human monitors, whatever it is, to track that content to then figure out what it's going to do with it and how it's going to treat it. So it forces them to overregulate that space. So it's not going to be the open space that we're used to anymore. And frankly, I would be curious to know what these platforms decide to do because that costs a lot of money, right? Are they going to restrict the content that we see? Are they going to pull out of the Canadian market? Obviously, that's an extreme kind of result and likely a last resort. But it also means that the CRTC would end up, I guess, looking at all the different content to, to check to see that it's complying with these requirements. So it'll be looking at all of our weird cat videos and, and the things that are being pushed <laughs> to Canada. And that's a huge imposition on a regulator. And that costs a lot of money. And that's something for Canadians to think through is that, does this really deliver the objectives that we want 
to, again, narrowly regulate a broadcaster, or are there other ways to achieve the objectives? We'll be right back. In terms of regulating streaming services and social networks, I think I kind of want to mention two things. One, this is happening worldwide. And there are a bunch of countries that are looking at different ways. Obviously, there was a controversy with Australia and Facebook and Google earlier this year. And so the Canadian government is obviously undertaking it in their own way. But I also think the other thing here is, is that we're going to be taxing these streaming companies more. I think this is part of it. So I guess one of the questions is, is these new regulations, is this the cost of doing business here? Well, that's an interesting way to ask the question. And you're thinking cost of doing business for big tech? Or are you asking if Canada is kind of unusual in what it's proposing? For big tech, yes. For big tech, exactly. Yeah, I mean, certainly Minister Gibo has made it very clear that he's targeting big tech. And I think it's bad in the way he's doing it. But certainly, there's a huge period of backlash against tech companies right now. It is a reckoning right now. And that reckoning is because it has been largely a... I wouldn't say a freewheeling space, but it's certainly not been a heavily regulated space for big tech. And because of that, it's sort of morphed into these giant beasts. Why I have concerns about the way Minister Gubo is approaching it is, you know, really two things. One, he's made it so blatant that his target is big tech as though they are in and of itself bad. They're not. There are problems with kind of the way that big tech has disrupted everything about how our world operates. And the internet is matured and we need to regulate that. But the other side of it is we need to regulate it in a thoughtful way. So I was at a conference a few weeks ago. It was this action summit on hate and and Mr. Gibo talked about how he just doesn't believe in self-regulation. Okay, that's fine. I mean, self-regulation in and of itself, you know, it's like when you talk about corporate responsibility, you know, it becomes just a way for companies to either dress it up as branding that they've complied or, or it just is ineffective. But it's not self-regulation or heavy regulation, which is the approach he's taken. If we really want to regulate the internet and big tech, we have to take approaches that are more like scalpel approaches. We need to be thoughtful about it. We need to understand that the internet is global and we make one move and it can disrupt the whole ecosystem. So, you know, what is the impact on the Canadian economy? It's going to be huge if this kind of hammer is taken to regulating big tech without a more thoughtful approach. You know, the, the link tax, the harm online harms legislation we're seeing proposed, the website blocking that we are expecting. And at the same time, in the other minister's portfolio, we're seeing the privacy legislation. So we're seeing a whole suite of changes coming. You jumped ahead to something, the online harms legislation. I want to talk about that, but I want to talk a bit more broadly. And you touched on this already. And it's about the idea about online regulation as a whole and why it is so so thorny. Why are there what seem to be good ideas, things to say, protecting any content or people online? How can they have such dangerous unintended consequences? The other thing you mentioned is is the difficulty here is, is that we're trying to protect our borders in a worldwide network where these things are not. So I think these are sort of two things I would love for you to unpack. One, why is it so difficult to regulate? And then the other thing is, is how hard it is to do it in a vacuum in Canada compared to the world? Yeah, so we are seem to be going in circles often when it comes to internet regulation. So the you mentioned the idea of borders, right? And this is singularly one of the most challenging things in internet regulation. And we are no further ahead than we were when we commercialized the internet in the 1990s. And that is the idea that we are a sovereign nation with our own laws and our own cultural values as well. So for example, our balancing of the right to freedom of expression against other rights is going to be different than other countries and we are different than say the United States. But the problem that we can't seem to get past is that the internet is global. So for example, If a Canadian court, for example, the Supreme Court of Canada is judgment in Google and Equistec saying that, you know, Google in that specific instance should delist something globally, that just sets off the whole internet regulatory framework because you have a country imposing something worldwide. But here's the tricky thing. Sometimes that's appropriate. But we haven't quite figured out what the metrics are for when that's appropriate, 
or not appropriate. So we have to often figure out that internet regulation involves a lot of players. It's not just courts, it's not just governments. It actually means you need to have the businesses at the table. You need to have civil society organizations saying, actually, you know, we should talk about how this impacts particular groups in a way that it doesn't impact others. We need to understand that it's international in nature. And so that means that, you know, one small move can kind of have this this sort of ripple effect. And we need to be conscious of that. You mentioned the online harms legislation. What can you tell us about that? And what is that supposed to tackle? Yeah, so this is actually a good example, too, about the disruption in the ecosystem, right? It relates to online harms. And I'm just going to add something to the last question you had. To give you an example of the ripple effect, website blocking has been a particular point of contention. It has been on the table potentially that that would enable blocking of websites that host pirated content. Now, this is seen as a risky move, and it is because it censors content, right? It means that we don't access it in the first place, and this is usually seen as a last resort. But there is a movement towards blocking, and we've always blocked, for example, content that is child pornography content. So it's a tool that is used. It's just the fear of sort of this downward spiral of it that it might then lead to blocking of offensive content. So where do we see that play out? Well, for example, recently in India, the government was ordering social media to block content that was about the uprising of the farmers, right? And so it was protest content, it's activist content. So we can't have a conversation here about website blocking without understanding it in this wider human rights context. So that brings me to online harms. I'm really curious what is going to be proposed. What I have heard is that there will be a proposal for a tribunal, kind of a social media type tribunal. I'm actually supportive of that. I think that that is a great idea. But again, it always comes down to how it's done. It could end up being poorly executed and end up being disastrous. And I'll have to, you know, eat my words, right? So here's why a social media tribunal is is a great idea. If we care about people and the harms of, for example, sharing of intimate images, abuse, bullying, privacy invasions, then we need to think about access to justice and access to a remedy. Let's be clear, going to a court, hiring a lawyer, none of that is an option. And it's not fast. I mean, it takes months. There might not even be clearly established cause of action. You can't, there's no clear cause of action for a breach of privacy in Alberta. So we have so many holes in the law and we have a a problem about accessing a remedy that actually is of any use here. Tribunals are a way through that. Tribunals are a way for faster access to remedies. They can have certain expertise to try to deal with it. They can be all around great, but it also is that they could develop kind of develop other options. They can provide education. They can provide technological support to people to say, scrub their content Whatever it is, there's a lot more flexibility there. If it's not done well, then this kind of tribunal is just some sort of censorship body that's poorly executed, that just sits there and with the gavels yelling, take it down, without any thoughtfulness or understanding of our charter rights. So I I say that as a caution. An example would be, I've heard rumors that there's going to be a takedown rule for, you know, there's a 24-hour rule for content takedown. Can you imagine a tribunal that could just sit there and say, take it down, you know, and then give a company 24 hours to do so? It's blunt and it actually doesn't achieve what we want. I mean, what do we want? We want to reduce the amount of hate speech online. We want to reduce the impact of these harms on the individuals and groups that are impacted. But we also need to know the difference between hate speech and, for example, like what are the common posts taken down on social media? Often it was Black Lives Matter's posts. So is this actually addressing the harm or is this hate speech in itself? That's a contextual analysis in a 24-hour takedown incentivizes a lack of a contextual analysis. There are some critics who say that this new legislation isn't necessary because we already have existing laws that cover it. Like, for example, hate speech law. What do you think about that? Well, just because you have laws on the books doesn't mean that they actually do anything. 
right? There aren't exactly many prosecutions of hate crimes in Canada. And also there's a difference between having a criminal law versus a civil law or having a different regulatory body that's broader than just looking at liability or content takedown, but it's about how do we actually address these kind of problems that we want to deal with. So I think that it's a real red herring to say, oh, we have certain laws on the books and and that's that. I will say this though, There is some value in incremental development of the law. And I've had conversations with practitioners about this, you know, that their fear is we're so busy looking for this grand solution. And meanwhile, time just ticks on and there's no real improvement in the system that we do have. So we should look at the laws we have and ways to improve it. You know, some basic things like we should reintroduce the hate speech provision to our federal human rights legislation, something like that, so that we can actually go to the human rights commission that exists now to address some of the online harms that we see happening. I believe Bill C-10 is back up for debate in the government on Friday. I'm curious, what are you expecting? And I like to end with a pretty open question. Is there anything I didn't ask that you think our listeners should know? So Bill C-10, I'm curious what the new provision will be that they introduce. I understand that they are kind of revamping it. This is where I'm nervous. Let's say that they're going to redraft something and they're, you know, targeting not user generated content specifically, but there's, you know, certain, I don't even know exactly what they're looking to address. It's like music content, but is it user generated music content? Is it, I mean, what is it, right? They need to go back to first principles about the purpose of broadcasting legislation and and broadcasting policy to actually address whether it achieves their objectives. And I'm not convinced that's going to happen. And they do need a charter assessment of that. And I could care less about the technicalities that they talked about, about when that should happen. They should be concerned if there's charter risks and they should assess that. If there's something that we haven't addressed, you know, I think that we have covered most of the big issues we face, but I want to leave maybe with one thought. Our conversation naturally bounced around to so many different areas, and that highlights a real gap, and that is these kinds of digital issues cut across sectors. We need some way that there's almost a regulatory, either an agency or not necessarily a regulator, but some sort of oversight that actually thinks through digital policy, broadly speaking, and that, well, if you're going to change this broadcasting law, you want to look at online harms, or you want to change privacy laws, what does it look like? It's like an ecosystem of laws that regulate this area. Without that broader perspective, we're never going to get very far in actually thoughtfully regulating this space and balancing human rights in the way that we want. That's a great note to end on. Dr. Layla, I really want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. Emily Laidlaw is the Canada Research Chair in Cybersecurity Law and an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Raji Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisas. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our Director of Programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.